Peter, in trying to understand what the nature of consciousness is, how our mental activity works, um, if my mental activity is going to be meaningful at all, it has to cause something. And something has to be the result of it, rather than just fl fl uh, floating away like the, the foam on a wave. So uh, how do we start? How do we start with the concept of of mental causation, of top down from my mental sense to the the generation of of of, uh, of mental activity. Right. So there, there have been uh, well a couple of real problems with the idea of mental causation from the perspective of a physicalist reductionist point of view. Uh, one is that um, well, how can a mental event cause anything when it's realized in a physical event? Well, if we're living in a world in which physical events trigger physical events according to physical laws, we could just dispense with mental events as some sort of epiphenomenal or non-causal um, fluff on the waves. Another part of the problem has been the twin uh, devils of philosophy, which are determinism on the one hand and indeterminism on the other hand. So if, if the world is entirely deterministic, well, things have to happen. Deterministic means that the, there's every, only one possible future right. at any given moment. So, and given you, the world as it is now, you can predict the, for the rest and, of the universe. If you knew the laws of physics, you could predict every, everything, everything forever. It's almost like the playing out of a movie. Right, right. right. You can imagine Woody Allen saying, "I have free will. I have free will." But he, the real is just playing its way out. So, you have a determinism on the on the one hand. Well, how could mental events make any difference if things are just playing out physically there? Right. Uh, then you have indeterminism, where well. Things are just happening by chance, right? Yeah, quantum effects or whatever yeah, that you can't predict. Right. It's impossible. So, so, it, so there's you know, no there's mental events look like you're doing something, but but, just but they're really not. Random stuff, random, and right. you know, you would think, well, maybe random things would just happen, but in fact, you know, they don't seem to be radically random. Uh, I'm advocating a middle path between the sort of skilla of determinism and the charybdis mm -hmm. of indeterminism, which is that um, neurons can reset the criteria that will make a subsequent neuron fire. And should those criteria be met in the future, then uh, that neuron will fire and that information will be realized. Now, why is that um, not determinism and not indeterminism? Right. Well, what it is, is, um, the, is your brain harnessing chance to fulfill its own ends in a way. And um, I, the first person to, to have this insight was William James. And I think that William James was following in a way Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin had the idea that there's, uh, well, there's random genetic variation that leads to variation in phenotypes and then selection by natural selection or sexual selection of what is most fitting for that environment. And that happens again and again. And th that metaphor he might have got from capitalism. You have lots of co companies, <laughs> then market forces select the best. William James said, okay, well, maybe there's the generation of lots of possible ideas randomly, but there's a second stage that selects the best one. And he was thinking of it at the level of ideas. I'm thinking of it at the level of um, neurons, where uh, mental activity now can set the criteria for future mental activity. That can be met in multiple different ways. That's multiply realizable. realizable. That neur those neurons can be triggered in multiple different ways. By different neurons. Different by different neurons. Of, right? Creating the same result. It could be a different combination of neurons coming in. Because remember, you know, a, post a, a neuron is responding to simultaneous inputs. But if spike timing is, itself has a component of randomness, because it's amplifying even you know, quantum level events right. in the synapse right. up to s randomness and spike timing, you might have different inputs causing that neuron to fire. And which inputs will cause it to fire are not um, knowable, uh, and they're not predetermined, and yet they're not totally random either, because they're self-selected. So if I say to you, for example, you know, think of, um, you know, uh, a beautiful woman. Poof. Not, not hard know. to do. Right? So Lauren Bacall comes, comes to your head. Poof. Why Lauren Bacall? Well, that was the set of inputs that met that criteria first. If you had rewound the system, if I'd rewound the system, I could rewind the whole universe, mm -hmm. and you're the same person, everything's mm -hmm. identical. Now, you know, uh, Ingrid Bergman might come to mind. So there's, uh, you were able to specify, I will think of a beautiful woman, but which one you would which would come to mind uh, wasn't pre-specified, and there was a degree of 
randomness and that. And I think that if you look at life, you know, it has this whole contingent feel to it, right? Why did um, why did Anne marry Bob in, instead of Joe? Well, you know, both might have been perfect husbands. Joe might maybe be better looking and what did I say? <laughs> Bob? Anyway, this other one might be more handsome, but why'd she marry that one? Well, he, he met her criteria first. That's, you know, and had she turned down a different corner, the other guy might have met those criteria first. So there's a whole contingent feeling to life that's also true in the brain. So, so looking at the individual neuron then being this uh, midway between determinism and indeterminism, this third way, so to speak, um, how, how does that uh, affect the so-called computational theory of mind, which is uh, in the computer age, uh, the kind of the metaphor of the moment in terms of uh, how the brain works? Right, right, right. So it's, it's, it's just so interesting how every age uses the most complicated physical thing of the moment to be the metaphor of the yeah. mind. Right? The so clock in the early uh, 20th the century. Leibniz said it's, the mind is just like a mill, and Freud said it's just like a hydraulic system, yeah. and, you know, and now we're saying it's just like a computer. But I, I have to say, this is a terrible metaphor because the brain is just manifestly not like a computer, right? There's no software-hardware distinction. There's no computer in the world that's conscious, uh, con every, every day rewiring itself. There's... Um, uh, no consciousness in, in computers, right? So th there's nothing like hunger in a computer. So the, it's a very bad metaphor, um, and we should realize its limitations. Now, the computational theory of the brain is based upon this metaphor, that um, brain events are tantamount to the activity of a, an idealized uh, algorithmic machine, a Turing machine. I think that this is just wrong. I think that uh, the brain is not algorithmic. Neurons, in fact, are not algorithmic. Uh, so what, what is an algorithm? An algorithm takes um, one input, like a CPU, one input. It makes a binary decision, this way or this way, and it sends one output. Neurons in contrast can take, you know, thousands of inputs simultaneously and send out lots of inputs to other neurons. And so the brain is not, each neuron is not functioning like a CPU. It's not functioning algorithmically. I think it's functioning um, massively parallelly and it's functioning criterially. So um, criteria is very, are very interesting, right? If you look at philosophy, the first philosopher to really focus on criteria was Wittgenstein, the later Wittgenstein, in which he made, I think, a very interesting observation that we actually can't find uh, necessary and true conditions that define what is a game or what, you know, he talked about family resemblances. Well, it might turn out that, you know, well, let's talk about family, a family, right? You have a bunch of people, well, they're all related and they, you know, might have similar hair color and similar nose shapes, and, but they're all different. And if I say, you know, all Norwegians must be blonde. Well, actually, there's some non-blonde Norwegians. Okay, I must say all, you know, uh, Norwegians must have fair skin. Well, in fact, there's some that have dark skin. And so if you try to specify any criteria, well, there might be something that doesn't meet those criteria. And I think that... Uh, if you build your system not upon uh, rules, but upon criteria which can be satisfied in multiple ways, you end up with a system that's very different from present-day computers. Does this contradiction of the computational theory of mind depend upon an indeterminate universe? The arguments that I am making about how neurons cause neurons to fire could operate in a deterministic universe. And in, if that were the case, then the best you could hope for would be a kind of compatibilist notion of free will or mental causation. Uh, however, I think there's very but strong... it's still not a computational theory of mind? There's still a non-algorithmic approach to the neurons in a deterministic yes, universe? Yes, because... The, the, How are you getting randomness into the system then? The, um, in this, in, the criteria are nonetheless being, being met. And the criteria are, are, you know, there's a threshold and there's lots of different ways that the criteria can be met. There's not, a, it's not a, a single rule saying, you know, if this is the case, then you must do this. But if there's indeterminism in the system, and I believe that there is, uh, I think that, you know, the, there's evidence from quantum theory that how even individual particles will turn out uh, is not pre-specifiable in any clear way. If, if you allow for there to be noise in the system, indeterminism in the system, that indeterminism or randomness can be harnessed uh, by the system to generate novel and unexpected outcomes. 
So, you know, take, take uh, someone like Mozart. He's trying to do a creative act, like write a symphony, and he wants to write a symphony that sounds, say, at the moment, happy. And he says, okay, well, the criteria that would be a happy melody are this, this, and this, and this. And then things will percolate, percolate up because you have, you know, neurons firing, triggering neurons firing, you know, and that noise in the system will be met in uh, uh, um, many possible different ways. The outcome will be something that sounds like Mozart because it's Mozart's brain that's specifying those criteria. But if you rewound Mozart back to the beginning and ran the system again because of amplification of noise, you might end up with a different melody at the end of that process. And then and, and on top of that, once you allow consciousness and working memory to come into play, you could say, well, you know, some solution will percolate up into working memory and Mozart will say, um, da, 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 da. no, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> Send it back down to the, you know, the uh, elves in the basement and let them come up with some other solutions. And so it's an open loop process. And at what point Mozart will say, that's it. You know, that can be uh, done on the, uh, on the basis of very high level criteria held in working memory, uh, such as, well, I need to be done by five, or it has to have a certain kind of beauty. So you reject the computational theory of mind either in a deterministic universe or an indeterministic universe, right? Well, I'm just saying that the brain is not operating like a Turing machine. Right, and yeah. irrespective of how the universe is working. And then how different would the way it's working be in indeterministic or indeterministic universe? If we were in a deterministic universe, how would your Mozart metaphors work? Well, okay. well first let me say that I, I, I worry that the issue of determinism versus indeterminism determinism is simply not uh, answerable. Because if you had, even if you had a deterministic universe, any subset of it, like a brain, would have causal influences coming in from the outside. And so relative to that frame of the uh, brain, things just seem to be happening for reasons that are not solely dictated by what's happening inside the brain. There's, you know, cosmic rays could be coming in. So the only uh, mm -hmm. sense in which determinism makes sense is to talk about the whole universe. But we can't observe the whole universe. So it might not be a, a empirically answerable question. So there's that. Um, if uh, there is noise or randomness in the system that can be amplified up to the level of spike timing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And if uh, neurons are coincidence detectors, which inputs will meet those criteria that are, that are placed on inputs uh, at any given moment is not specifiable. It's not knowable to the person who, whose brain it is or to any observer of that, of that brain. If there's uh, randomness at any level, in, that can be amplified up to the level of uh, spike timing uncertainty. And so I think that there's real room for creativity and novelty in the brain, um, and therefore in the universe, because we can then act on the universe and create incredible things.